Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this in uh, our latest um, webinar covering uh, topics of interest in relation to social housing in Scotland. Uh, today, what I'm going to um, touch on is um, uh, just some my own thoughts on what are the current issues that I've seen lately on deals, um, financing deals in, in, in the Scottish market. And also, and this is very risky, but I'm going to do a bit of um, horizon gazing as to what I think may be issues that uh, will be to the fore in uh, 2025. Um, and I like to think in relation to that, that, well, if we repeat this at the end of 2025, nobody will remember what I've said today. So I think I'm fairly safe in, uh, uh, you know, having a, having a little bit of a uh, naval gaze ahead. So by way of introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris Dunn. So I'm a, bank, a banking and finance partner here at um, uh, Brodie's, and I specialize in social housing um, uh, uh, finance. Um, and uh, we do a lot of work for both uh, lenders and, and investors into the market, as well as for, for housing associations and other participants in the social housing and the wider housing market. So... I'm going to pick out just three or four points that I think are of interest in terms of current issues uh, for, for us to look at uh, today. Um, so the, the first of those um, is um, that is the based hedging is, is back. Um, uh, uh, we, we last saw is the based hedging in the Scottish social housing market really many years ago and a very small number of housing associations amended their rules um, to allow for such hedging, and um, they entered into swaps and other hedging arrangements. But it's a very, it's a very small number. That that's going, that has changed already this year, and is is going to, I think, be a continuing theme. And this has a number of quite important um, uh, repercussions for housing associations. Um, uh, the f the first of which is that um, they need to have uh, what what we term extended rules. So rather than just having standard rules, um, they need to have rules that are specifically extended to allow them to enter into that sort of hedging under an ISDA uh, agreement. Um, and ev even if they currently have extended rules, which quite a few associations do, they definitely should be reviewing them because they're probably going to be insufficient as they stand uh, to allow them to hedge with quite a lot of counterparties that they may wish to do so. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of the rules were very restrictively drafted um, when when they were first put forward. They refer to hedging, for instance, with a leading um, clearing bank or words to that effect. Um, but um, this was all happened before the banks all broke up. So um, what, what you'll find now is that um, your hedging counterparty might not be a leading clearing bank, but it might be a subsidiary or an affiliate of a leading clearing bank or indeed another entity. But it should be perfectly acceptable as a hedging counterparty, but wouldn't be caught within those restricted provisions. Um, so you're almost certainly going to have to have a look at those, even if you've got them, to see if they should be extended. And we have acted recently on uh, a number of deals where um, uh, housing associations have had rules, but they've needed to extend them to allow for the hedging. Uh, and the reason it's, it's a good idea to be reviewing that at the moment is it's just quite a cumbersome process to change your rules. So you need to hold a special general meeting to do so to begin with. And the second thing a housing association does, um, it needs to do, it needs to register the rule change with the FCA. And the rule change only becomes effective on registration. And the FCA, in my experience, are, become, are becoming slower and slower in dealing with that registration process. So it can be quite frustrating if you if if a housing association decides 
We want to enter into some ISDA-based hedging. We want to take advantage of market rates at the moment, enter into a swap or, 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 or whatever, and then they find that, oh, we can't do it because we don't have the rules and we're waiting for the FCA and they're taking an age just to um, deal with the real change that we need. So I, I would recommend if you are a housing association and what you should be doing is considering putting in the real change up front to cover the possibility that at some point in the future you might want to enter into this sort of hedging um it doesn't commit you to entering into it but it just it, it's just an enabling uh, pr process and it would mean that it's sort of oven ready as and when you might want to take advantage of it, and then you don't get the frustration that you can't take advantage of current market rates at the, at the relevant time. Um, so, and just as, as, a, as an aside, on, on, on the documentation side here, what, what we're talking about is an ISDA agreement and a schedule, the very, fairly both standardized documents. Um, they act sort of as an umbrella agreement with the hedging counterparty. And then under those, you enter into the specific trades. So even if you haven't got the extended rules, it doesn't stop you entering into the ISDA agreement because that's not actually hedging. It's the underlying transaction that constitutes the hedging that you would need the extended rules to enter into. Um, you would also need to make the hedging counterparty a finance party under your facility documentation. And the other thing you need to think about is you might need to grant new security or or re-grant your security or repaper it, because if you've got security that's just granted on a bilateral basis, as quite a lot of associations do to a lender, and it secures all sums due to that lender under a facility agreement or just generally, it won't cover a hedging counterparty who will need to be secured or benefit from the security. So there can be a repapering exercise required. Again, that can be time consuming. So it's something you want to think about up front. So if you're planning and thinking, oh, I might want to do some hedging next year, this is this this is the time to be thinking about doing it and putting everything in place and getting prepared for it. Um, it's not something you're going to be able to turn around in a in a in a in a couple of weeks or, or whatever at the relevant time. Um, so that that's the first thing I was going to mention is the base hedging back with uh, with an, a, a vengeance. In in some ways, it's a great it's a great thing. It gives you more flexibility, and it, it, you know I think it's what the market really really requires. You're still talking about very plain vanilla hedging in practice. Um, nothing um, uh, too um, uh, um, risky in terms in terms of what 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 would be put in place. Um, sec second area new issues or current issues we're saying new things um the private placement market um that's that's active again in, in scotland um so we, we current recently done a, a, a new pp traction a transaction um uh, for one of the scottish um um registered social landlords um it it comes with a caveat though i think it is back and it's active was definitely seeing it in England quite a lot. But reality is access is going to be limited, and I think more limited than before, to only the largest of the housing associations operating in Scotland. So you might be talking about the top 10, even you know less than that possibly, in terms of the sort of um, HAs who might be able to access the PP market. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, Great additional potential source of finance. There's plenty of debt out there and funds who are wanting to invest pension money, etc. Um, but there might be restrictions on who, who can actually access it. If you are planning to undertake a PP and it's a first time PP, um, and sorry, a private placement just by for, for those, sorry, this, this is obvious, I apologize. But it's, it's really just a, an IOU arrangement. So you enter into a loan note agreement, um, a note purchase agreement it's called, un under which you issue loan notes to investors undertaking to pay um, interest or, um, or, 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 or actual capital in, in terms of those notes over a certain period of time. 
and it's it's secured through uh, through security over over housing stock. So it would sit very much parallel to um, um, uh, any any loan documentation. But if you are planning for the first time, what I would say is you need to plan it in advance again. Um, and you need to allow yourself an appropriate window to complete such an exercise. You'll get PP investors and advisors saying, oh, we can wrap all this up together in a month. They won't be able to. You know, you're looking at, in my experience, two to three months men to um, get one of these sort of deals through. And uh, particularly, you know, if there's a, there's a, a significant charging exercise needing to be run in parallel with it. So... PP markets. That's that's. I guess a, a positive sign mm. that it's 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 back um, um, in, in happening. Um, third thing I'm going to mention very quickly is um, sustainability linked loans. Um, I spoke about this not so long ago. They are very much becoming the norm now. And um, we see on almost every deal we we act on in the term sheet, there'll be sustainability linked terms applied. Um, so we find either those terms are fully worked up at day one or more commonly um, the documentation is put in place on a sort of oven-ready basis with um, a format of a side letter agreed so that they can be put in place at a, at a, at a later time once the parties have agreed what um, um KPIs and, and targets uh, that, that are suitable for them in terms of their ESG um, uh, co commitments and what 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 what's going to be met, and you, you commonly give you know get allowed about a year to um, finalize um, those, those those provisions so you can work them up in in conjunction with your sustainability um, um, program and, and um, um, business planning. Um, uh, I, although we find the 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 maximum margin ratchet is um, is still very low, um, it's not unusual for it to be something like five bips if you're meeting all your targets. It, that's not what really drives this. What's driving it is that it's it's what um, uh, both housing associations and uh, lenders investors expect to see, and it, and it reflects what parties believe. Um, that should they should be doing. Um, so it's a sort of small added bonus that there might be a margin ratchet, but it's certainly not the reason to be doing doing this. Um, what we're not seeing yet are reverse margins. We're seeing sort of a positive margin reduction. What what we're not yet seeing is um, a margin increase if you don't meet certain targets. I think in due course that's what we're going to get to. I think it will become the norm that there will be um, targets set, and I in, in due course I think if you don't meet your uh, sustainability targets, you're probably going to end up having to pay maybe a little bit more for your debt than if if you are meeting them. So it's certainly something that should be built into planning process um, 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 now now. Uh, and something to be thought about if you're looking at new debt, because it's likely to be um, something that will appear in term sheets um, when 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 you get them through. If you're um, t tendering for for new debt or investment, um, and the final thing I was going to mention, just in terms of um, the current market and what we're seeing, this is not 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 necessarily uh, a, a great thing from a housing association's perspective, but we're seeing an increased level of due diligence required. Um, and this particularly covers um, where there's existing security. So it, it, it would be uh, common that you would get um, security maybe granted over the last 10, 15, 20 years, and it's already in place. It might have been granted to an external security trustee, but it might have been granted on a bilateral basis to a lender. The association might have developed, become larger. It's moved on to a syndicated basis. But that initial due diligence when the security is granted might have been done some time ago. Now, traditionally in the social housing movement, and this compares to, say, just the, the real, real estate finance sector, you wouldn't have expected to see that due to that security re 
due diligence, you would have expected uh, lenders and investors just to have relied upon the original due diligence. What we're seeing more is that lenders, or at least some lenders, are looking to have fresh due diligence conducted. Um, and depending on the age of the original due diligence, um, you know, if it was done like more than three years ago, more than five years ago, more than 10 years ago, whatever the periods might be set, you might either need to be looking to try to get to reliance letters from the original authors of certificates of title and other reports, which can be difficult if they're no longer your panel law firms because you've no longer got a lever over them. You might then be looking at maybe some limited fresh title due diligence, new searches, people checking titles and securities, et cetera, or for where you've got older security granted and it's been accepted in in the past and that's what's been relied upon but more and more credit credit requirements of lenders will be that that security might have to be re um, certified so you might have to have completely new certificates of title produced so all that um, needless to say is going to um, incur time and and additional cost. Sometimes it can be pushed to a condition subsequent uh, rather than a CP to the new finance exercise. But my recommendation would be when you're agreeing terms with a lender, you want to be checking what DD you're going to need to do, when are you going to need to do, do, do it by, you know, is it a CP, can it be a CS, and then working out what, what are the costs of this and what are the, what are the options round about it to minim, minimise the, 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 the impact of, of the issue. Um, particularly important if you're considering maybe moving valuation methodologies from EUVSH to MVST, these sorts of issues all link to the due diligence that might be needed in these circumstances. So it's definitely something that should be looked at up up front at the um, the term uh, stage. So that's that's all the lovely positive stuff about what's going on at the moment. Um, um, except to say maybe there is a lot going on. So um, we're we're very busy at the moment. So there is a lot of financing going on. The market is definitely not all doom and gloom. Uh, at the moment um, it's challenging out there in terms of terms um, you know business plans are, are under stress at the moment but it's not stopping um, the, 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 the the market so there are there are a lot of financing uh, deals happening out there but so w- what's on the horizon if we move forward for for 2025 what are we going to see next year um, so um I think what we may see is we may see more entrance into the Scottish uh, marketplace. Um, um, I've certainly spoken recently to a number of banks and other lenders who are interested in the Scottish marketplace and would like to do deals. Some of them are looking at the top end of the market in terms of debt sizes and deal sizes, but there's others who are, who'd be much more committed at the um, sort of um, the, the, the smaller debt side and, and, and end of the market in the mid, mid-sized market. So I, th- I think that's what something that we, we might see next year. What I don't think this will mean is that you'll see pricing getting squeezed or terms getting better. I, I think that they're unlikely to be relaxed next year. You might have more more participants in the market chasing deals, but I don't I don't see myself that you're going to see much difference in terms of pricing or terms. I think it's all going to be pretty much as it as it, as it, as it is now. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think we might see more PP entrants, but with a limited deal flow in, in, the, in the Scottish market due, due to the size of deals that some of the, some of the PP investors are now looking to um, get covered. And the reason, the reason I say this in England, um, you know, it's common uh, that they might look at something like housing associations with 20,000 units upwards for PPs. So that's not unusual in England. So a, a lot of house associations will meet that sort of um, uh, standard. But obviously, that's very unusual in the Scottish marketplace. So does Constantina in Scotland that that that, that the availability of, of 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 that debt? If if we could ever get something brought together, whereby we could um, get a um, uh, a 
conduit type arrangement to, to to you know so you could do a bigger deal and feed it down to a number of smaller associations that would be great but um obviously um that's been worked on a, a lot over the years and with no success to date and i really don't see next year that there's going to be a solution to that um so second point i don't think there's going to be any material change to the terms that we're seeing on deals um, I think pricing likely to remain quite similar. I think we'll also see um, um, covenants remaining at similar levels. Uh, the move to EBITDA only will, I think, continue um, and become the norm for new, you know, for deals go, going going forward, which will give some relaxation. Um, but ultimately, I think the terms will remain. Uh, this, the 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 rough rough roughly the same um, due diligence. I'm afraid to say, having already said that it's becoming stricter, I think it's going to become even stricter. I think I think lenders um, uh, and and investors and in, and in under um, uh, capital market transactions are going to look for more and more detailed um, due, due due diligence, and that's going to lead. To deals taking longer to do and becoming more 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 expensive so that's i think something to just bear in mind when you're planning transactions that it might it might take longer to put them all together um in terms of the process so you need to be looking ahead in terms of um when you're planning to have finance transactions put it put in place and new debt um, um you documented um I think linked to the other reason I think deals are going to take longer is that I think credit, in my experience, is just taking longer and longer. Um, there's much more, much more challenge um, by by credit departments of of, of lenders. Um, um, whether we're moving to sort of not seeing. The, the wood for the trees slightly on some of these issues I'm, I'm not I'm not sure um but I certainly think that you know you'll see longer um de deals um uh, because um um credit is going to take longer and it's more difficult and this is the sort of the power shift within um, lending organizations to their credit departments I think is 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 is, is driving a lot uh, a lot of this. We're also in, because we're in Scotland. We we'll, we we'll, we generally have um, when you're dealing with uh, lenders not in in in, in located in Scotland. You have that translation issue that we have to tell them why the Scottish market's better than the English market. You know what, what the strength of our regulatory position here, etc. So there's a lot. There's a bit of sales pitch that we need that you need to be putting forward just to so that lenders are aware. As to what the position is in Scotland and why this should be a very attractive jurisdiction for them to be lending into. Um, I mentioned hedging earlier, so we're seeing more ISDA-based hedging. Against that, embedded fixed rate hedging, we're already seeing that becoming more restricted. So we're seeing the minimum amounts for um, uh, fixed rate loans increasing and increasing substantially. Um, where you know, whereas um, lenders might have been happy previously to do a fixed rate loan for I don't know two hundred fifty k, five hundred k, whatever, and you might see that in historic documents. Um, those those figures have been pushed up into multiples of millions now. So you might so we're going to find a situation where fixed rate loans are going to have to be larger, which might again push you down to the hedging side because it might give you more flexibility in terms of a swap so something to bear in mind again when you're speaking to a lender what are their minimum fixed rate requirements are they likely to remain the same if you check your documentation your lending documentation it's all almost certainly drafted on the basis you can ask for a fixed rate loan of a certain size and there'll be minimum sizes but it will be at the lender's discretion as to whether they provide it so they will have the ability to say no, even if you've got something saying you can take a fixed rate loan of 500,000 or a million pounds, they'll have the ability to turn around and say, no, actually our policy is now changed and we require it to be a much larger sum. So if you've got a relatively small facility 
that can be quite an issue. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, managing exposure to interest rate movements, you need to be looking at maybe different um, um, approaches to this and trying to to work out how best to uh, to achieve this. Um, it's been some time now since um, uh, we, we used to see RCFs effectively used as term loans and you were allowed to have a fixed rate under an RCF. Uh, that that that's that's been moved some time ago, and normally now we'd say RCFs have to be on a floating rate basis. So um, you know that whole market's tight, tightening up. Um, so that's what we're seeing in 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 the market at the moment. Um, uh, I I, th I think next year is going to be. Interesting, certainly very challenging um, uh, ec economic position for for housing associations. And my all FDs of housing associations must be extremely difficult job at the moment. There will be debt out there. There's a lot of money sitting out there, but um, I think it, I think it's it's going to be tougher and tougher to put deals together. And I think they do need a lot of forward uh, planning. So that that would be the main. Um, uh, message I would be giving to everybody today. Um, that's all I was going to actually um, say today. Um, but I, I wondered if anybody had any questions. I was just going to check the the, the panel um, uh, to see if there were any um, any in the answer questions and answers. Um, <laughs> The, the one the one that um I'll, I'll just pick out just to comment on um i i there's a there's a question whether in the wider housing uh, finance um arena not just social housing finance but the wider housing finance arena i was seeing similar issues ar arising um and I, I I guess um uh in in, in some ways the answer to that is uh, is, is is yes um certainly I think I think um uh there's opportunities around about the private placement market which we haven't really um seen pushed um as, as yet so much in relation to the private housing market and the rented market um but I think I think um that's that's an area that I know, I know PP investors are quite in, in interested in, um, and I think we'll see uh, more of that, uh, and maybe not just PP investors, but the long term debt fixed rate debt providers who uh, you know, and there's lots of those out out, out there, life companies etc., who are providing very similar products. There's quite a lot of um, flexibility out there. We are seeing DD. Um, taking longer, and we're seeing um, credit taking taking longer. So deals just taking longer to 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 put together. So again, message would be uh, for, forward planning. I th I think generally what I am seeing is a bit of a breakdown between um, siloed sort of social housing deals and housing deals um, more generally. So as housing associations are moving much more into, say, mid-market rented housing um, um, and other, other forms of tenure, we're having to put together much more flexible uh, packages that might suit sort of the housing providers of the future you might have, you know, full market rented. They might be doing some build for sale, um, and you know, they, they, they may have some uh, purely sort of social house uh, rent, rented housing in the, in their portfolio. So, you know, there's there's different needs, and um, a lot a lot of the lenders we're acting for will, will be trying to cover all those bases and generally be sort of slightly sector agnostic in terms of their approach. They'll be interested in sort of looking at everything, but I think you'll see similar challenges in in in, in all in all sort of housing finance deals. I think uh, going forward and uh, over over the uh, over the next um, uh, short and medium period of time. Um, I'm co I'm conscious that everybody will be busy today, and that's half an hour of everybody's time. So thank you very much uh, for for dialing in today. Um, this is uh, one in a series of uh, webinars we're running. 
got two two coming up, which I think are uh, going to be very interesting. One's on infrastructure security on the 29th of October, and the other's on the new um, Housing Scotland bill, and that's on 13th November. So I'd encourage um, you to to attend those if you've got the time. I think they'll they'll be um, they'll be very interesting sessions. But thank you very much indeed for everybody um, dialing in today. And um, I hope hope you've um, found found this useful. Thank you. Bye bye.